Hi students, this is Mrs. Lindstrom. In this video, I will be modeling for you how one should critically read a piece of Puritan literature. Okay, let's get started. We'll be coupling our handwritten notes from this presentation with our annotated copy of Anne Bradstreet's poem. So please remember to write down the essential question here. Next, let's take a second to pause and take a look at our objectives. We'll be checking the understanding of these objectives as we apply what we learn in this presentation to other works of Puritan literature. So you've already read and annotated this poem for a general understanding and feeling. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna show you some of the words that I expected you might have struggled with or had to look up, and that's totally fine. And as I go through the poem and show you the things that I would annotate, these words will make a lot more sense to you as we go. Before we take a look at the poem as a whole, we're going to learn about a rhetorical concept called anastrophe. This is when a speaker or writer inverts the usual syntactical order of words for a rhetorical effect. You should also remember that syntax simply means word order. And there are many reasons why a poet or writer would want to utilize anastrophe and play around with syntax, and I'll show you three examples here. The character that George Lucas created, Yoda, from Star Wars, is probably one of the most famous examples of somebody who reverses their syntax when talking. So the example I have here is, powerful you have become, Doku, the dark side I sense in you. And I'm not even going to try to do the Yoda voice because I will wholly embarrass myself. But what you should notice here is that if this were in our normal, typical language in English, it would sound like, you have become powerful, Doku, I sense the dark side in you. So what's the effect that George Lucas creates with Yoda? He has created a character that is defined by his speech patterns. It makes him sound more wise, and it really basically created an icon. Speaking of icons, let's take a look at President Kennedy's famous example here. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. So here in this speech, what President Kennedy do, is doing is he's drawing attention to a specific point. He's trying to get the audience to pause or focus. So anytime someone speaks backwards, basically, you're going to be like, whoa, you're going to stop. You're going to pause because your brain is expecting the language to be flowing in a normal pattern. So when a rhetor or speaker stops us with that kind of speech pattern, it gets us to pay attention. It really gets us to focus. So like the others, Anne Bradstreet uses anastrophe to definitely draw our attention to certain points she's making, but it really works to preserve her rhyme scheme and the rhythm, the musicality of her poem. I'd also like to encourage you to think about ways that you can incorporate anastrophe into your own writings to help draw attention to certain points that you're trying to make as a writer. Okay, now that we have identified what anastrophe is, let's get into the poem. In silent night, when rest I took, for sorrow near I did not look. I wakened was with thundering noise and piteous shrieks of dreadful voice, that fearful sound of fire and fire, let no man know is my desire. Okay, so here we have, in terms of Puritan literature, this is personal. It's an individual experience, and it's written in the first-person point of view. I also want to draw your attention to her diction, her word choice. She uses words like piteous and shrieks and dreadful. These are all tone words that help establish how scary this moment for her is. And just an interesting point here regarding capitalization. Capitalization rules in the English language have changed over time, but in this case, she is focusing on this idea of desire. It's like, I absolutely, no one ever wants this to happen to your family, to your home, whatever. So in this early and kind of odd break from traditional Puritan writing, she is emphasizing her personal emotions. I, starting up, the light did spy, and to my God my heart did cry, to straighten me in my distress, and not to leave me succorless. Then coming out, behold a space, the flame consume my dwelling place. Okay, so from right from the get-go, we see that she goes straight to God. Okay, God, why is this happening? Help me get through my distress. So she's praying that God won't leave her without help. So this is typical of Puritan writing. They're going to God for every occasion. And then again, she's also the capitalization of D here. She is emphasizing her distress. And when I could no longer look, I blessed his name that gave and took, that laid my goods now in the dust. Yea, so it was, and so it was just. It was his own, it was not mine. Far be it that I should repine. He might of all justly bereft, but yet sufficient for us left. So what Anne Bradstreet is doing here is typical Puritan writing right here. We've got a big fat biblical allusion to Job the book of Job in the Old Testament, where the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. So that's a 
big hallmark of Puritan literature here. And then also here, this attitude here, it was his own. Everything is God's. And then right above that line, it happens, so it was just. That means it's right because God let it happen. And she goes right into this idea of we have enough. So another biblical allusion, too, is that her things are in the dust. Okay, so the dust, um, remember, you are dust and unto dust you shall return. That's a very biblical image as well. But also in terms of theme, what this imagery does here is it is suggesting the impermanence of everything. Things are here today, gone tomorrow. When by the ruins oft I passed, my sorrowing eyes aside did cast, and here and there the places spy where oft I sate and long did lie. Here stood that trunk, and there that chest, there lay that store I counted best. Okay, so just a note on the word sate. It looks like sat, but it isn't. This has to deal with being satiated and, like, eating. So, like, it's where I was eating and where I lived and hung out, basically. Um, the interesting thing here about the word aside is, like, think about when you give people sideways glances. You're either trying to hide your looking, or in this case, it's almost as if she's ashamed that she wants to look back at the ruins. She's almost embarrassed that she's letting herself kind of indulge in that emotion of looking back at something that basically she feels God let happen. And then a note on the Puritan plain style here. The word trunk and chest, these are just simple words describing ordinary things in someone's house. So if she were not writing in a Puritan plain style, she would use maybe a metaphor to describe the word trunk or a metaphor to describe the word chest. But instead, she just uses these simple nouns and moves on. Okay, so we've got a lot going on in lines 27 through 34. My pleasant things in ashes lie and then behold, no more shall I. So there we have inverted syntax right there. So she's really trying to draw our attention to her emotion that's coming up here. Under thy roof, no guest shall sit, nor at thy table eat a bit. Thy, she's personifying her house. Thy refers to her actual house. No pleasant talk shall e'er be told, nor things recounted done of old. This is her emotional response here. She's bummed. She's sad that she can't entertain. Basically, she is saying that I loved being able to hang out with my friends and my family in my house, and it's not happening anymore. No candle e'er shall shine in thee, again personifying her house, no bridegroom's voice e'er heard shall be. So this is that plain style coming up here. She's referencing everyday items and objects. And I know we don't use the term bridegroom, really. That's not something we use. Um, we use groom, actually. It's truncated now. But this is, for her time period, pretty typical normal things. You, you know, like, look at all the things I've highlighted. We've got roof, guest, things. These are all plain words. And she doesn't just go off and use metaphors and symbols and embellish them. In silence ever shalt thou lie, adieu, adieu, all's vanity. Okay, so what is she doing here? She's dismissing her emotions. She feels like she shouldn't be dwelling on these emotions that we talked about on the last slide. And also this vanity phrasing here, this is another biblical allusion. This is to the book of Ecclesiastes. And her audience would have been very familiar with these biblical passages. They wouldn't even skip a beat when they'd read this. Okay, now let's pay attention right here. This is where we have this turning in this poem. Then straight I again my heart to chide, and didst thy wealth on earth abide? She's essentially asking herself where true wealth lives. Didst fix thy hope on moldering dust? Did you fix your hope on things that are going to decay, things that are transient, things that don't last? The arm of flesh didst make thy trust? Raise up thy thoughts above the sky... That dunghill miss away may fly. More veering from the Puritan plain style here. We've got some pretty typical words. Again, they might not sound super typical to us, but to the Puritans, this would have been pretty, pretty common language. So what we're seeing here, especially in this particular chunk of the poem, is she's having a shift. She's saying, wait a second, nothing is permanent. I need to focus on God, and I'm actually going to get mad at myself for having that momentary sadness and being kind of um, addicted to my things. I know it sounds so bizarre because it's her home, but this is very Ignatian, actually, because St. Ignatius actually warns us against having these disordered attachments to things. But um, Anne Bradstreet, I just think, is super extra in this because she is saying, okay, my house is burned down and it must be God's will, and I am going to do God's will regardless of whether or not it brings me happiness or joy. 
I mean, you cannot get more puritanical thematically here than in this chunk of the poem. Thou hast a house on high erect, framed by that mighty architect. With glory, richly furnished, stands permanent though this be fled. It's purchased and paid for too, by him who hath enough to do. Okay, so we have a little bit of a digression from the Puritan plain style here where she's using a bit of an extended metaphor for this house in heaven. Um, there's a huge Puritan lesson right here. One's true home is with God. So whatever you got here on earth, it don't matter because eventually we will be with God and this is all transient and you just need to be ready. So the spot that I have here highlighted in yellow, this is an extended metaphor for that house in heaven. So hopefully you're starting to see this contrast between the house that you live in here on earth versus the house that you will end up spiritually in heaven with God. Okay, let's bring it home, Anne Bradstreet. A price so vast as is unknown, yet by his gift is made thine own. There's wealth enough, I need no more. Farewell my pelf, farewell my store. The world no longer let me love. My hope and treasure lies above. So here we have it. A big, fat Puritan lesson. Don't be attached to earthly things and live by spiritual ideals. Let's unpack this for a second. Let's take a look at an example of anastrophe here. The world no longer let me love. My hope and treasure lies above. Her use of anastrophe here in the second to the last line should read, don't let me love the world anymore, or don't let me love the world any longer. My hope and treasure lies above. So it is drawing attention, this this use of anastrophe, just uh, the musicality of it, it is drawing our attention to the point she's making here, to live by our spiritual ideals. It's actually pretty cool how she does that. Okay, so now that we've gone through this whole poem, let's process and reflect on the essential question and the objectives from the beginning of this presentation. You should be able to find at least three specific examples from the text that shows us how Anne Bradstreet's poem reveals the attitudes and values of the Puritans. I know that we've definitely been applying some prior knowledge in terms of the culture and the history of the Puritans. We've looked at different examples of the Puritan plain style in the poem. We've also identified elements of Puritan beliefs in this poem itself, and then we've defined, and I know I've identified uses of anastrophe here. My goal for myself in this presentation was to model for you how to annotate a Puritan poem or a Puritan piece of literature and write out my thinking as I encounter the text. So I think that I've done that here, and so now our goal as a class is to really get into the spirit of active reading and annotating all the works that we read going forward. That's right. Thanks, Yoda.